Hello University of Oklahoma engineering students. Uh, I'm Dino Segovis and I was asked to do this video by Ethan Van Meter. Hi Ethan. And uh, first I'd like to say I think it's a great idea that you all decided to take engineering. It's a very rewarding career and I'm sure you'll all do very well. You may not get the job you, uh, you hope for immediately, but if you stick with it, you probably will find something that's satisfying and rewarding and uh, both ways, monetarily and in the creativity aspect of it all. Uh, I got my experience basically by doing things. I never went to college for engineering. I'm a high school graduate, but I was always handy with building things and figuring things out mechanical. A lot of that came out of just doing those things when I was a kid. Didn't have a whole lot, so I built a lot of things myself. Um, I call it, uh, the way I go about things, the TLAR method of engineering. That looks about right. And uh, it works sometimes. Um, your intuition gets developed over time with a lot of trial and error. I encourage you to just go ahead and try making things. And uh, I know your instructors want you to use formulas and tables and graphs and math uh, because it does help out. but get in the trenches and just build stuff. There's nothing like that. It's great experience. It'll teach you a lot. It'll it'll uh, build your intuition, your gut instinct of what will work. And then you'll end up being able to build things the way I do. Like I say, the T-L-A-R method, that looks about right. And a lot of times it works out right. So the ball launcher, let me uh, take this thing apart, go through it step by step and show you how I problem solved along the way and what I was thinking as I ran into issues and, and how I solved the problems and made it work the way you've seen it work in the other video. Let's get, uh, let's get started. Okay, here we go. Back to the basics. You may have seen this already, but I'm going to show it to you again because it's very important. It's basically how the ball launcher works. This lever spins around in a circle. The spring is attached to a different point outside of the center pivot point. This pivots around its own circle. Well, the spring gets stretched, and once it goes over center, of course, it's going to try to return to its at-rest state, and as it does, it's, it's pulling that lever on around through the circle. Um, someone told me this is what's called a hysteresis, and I'm not really understanding what that is, but I do know that this this works. I've seen the hysteresis thing mentioned before, but uh, maybe I should read up on that. Anyway, the the point between here and here is kind of one of those TLAR things where I went, well, how, how much should that be? Well, I don't want to go too far because way out here, I'd have to put the spring way over here for it to be, you know, have tension on it to bring it back to center. But if you move the spring way over here, at that point, as it goes around, it's going to load up a whole lot more because it's pulling the spring quite a bit further, isn't it? See, if it's further this way and the spring is further this way, you've now loaded the system a lot more. So just imagine if this spring was here and the point where it anchors was over here. There would be a lot of tension on everything. So I knew I couldn't go too far. I had to keep it somewhat minimal, so I guessed about there, and I tried to stay with that sort of that ratio on the on the model. Where you see this black dot is where the ball would be, and so you can see what happens as it goes over center. It flicks the ball. So that was the basic proof of concept. I looked at that and went, "Hey, that'll work. How do I execute this now? How do I get a motor to spin this around and?" Let it, let it fling free as soon as it gets past the center point. It needs to be free to fling. There can't be a solid anchor to the motor at that point. It needs to be something just like the screwdriver pushing on it that can come back around and park. But it can't be on this side of the spring because it would, it would interfere with the spring. It would hang up on the spring. It needs to be something coming up from underneath. And so all along I had thought a power window motor would be a great idea for this. So... Let's look at this now uh, in a little more detail. Here is what I, I mounted the, the power window motor to the, to the board. You know, you saw that in the other video probably. Um, I'll get in a little bit closer for you to look at this a little better. This came out of a, a car that had a cable that wrapped around this drum, and the cable wrapped around one way and the other, and it was like kind of a, a push-pull system. And that's, that's how it, it moved the window up and down in the car. 
So I thought, well, I need to get the lever on there somehow. How do I do that and still let the lever run free? So I drilled a hole in the shaft right here, dead center. There's a hole that's been drilled and I tapped it with a one quarter inch by 20 thread per inch tap. That way I could put a bolt in it and then the lever could simply pivot on that bolt. Okay, now I screwed it down. I came up with just the right length of screw where it bottomed out and uh, that took care of the problem of tightening it yet leaving it where it can spin freely. That took a bit of trial and error. So as it goes in, it tightens up, but it doesn't tighten up so much that it doesn't let this just spin and run freely. Okay. Now we need to move that around, right? So to do that, I'm going to take this back off so you can see the arm that moves it is attached to the motor drum in a very stationary manner. It's screwed to it in two places and then there's just a simple bolt coming up through it right, right here. I'll give you another view of this in a minute. And that way this can swing around, take the lever from here on around to here. When it gets over center, whack, it hits the ball and it can come back. Well that's all fine, but it needs to come back and park itself each time. And it needs to do that in a, a manner where it stops at the same point each time, it gets triggered, and then it comes back around. So what happens is there's a micro switch right here that bumps into a little piece of plastic that I simply screwed to this drum. This cam hits this micro switch and that's what stops the rotation. Another micro switch off camera that I'm touching, which is the one that the ball hits is what triggers the device. I'll show you the wiring and how that works in a minute on a whiteboard. But you can see how it parks at the same spot every time. So it has the ability to go around, the thing hits over center, does its fling thing, and then it comes back and parks. So let's put this back on again. Most of the stuff that I make these things out of are just found materials. Um, that's also a lot of fun because you just take what you have at hand and figure out how to make it work, which is engineering in itself. It's problem solving. And uh, that's all good. So here's our, our lever pushing on another lever. And when it's triggered, oops, <laughs> it slams into the board. <laughs> okay, that goes on around. So now, let me get the camera off from its current mount. I'll give you a sideways view of how all this goes together. Okay, here you go from the side. Uh, you can see the bolt that comes up through here that pushes on the launch lever. And there's the micro switch and the cam. Let's get another view of that. Whoa. Pretty simple mechanism, really. It just bumps up against the switch, and it opens the switch, essentially, is what's going on. Like I said, I'll explain that in a minute. So there you see the basics of how it all goes together. That arm needs to be mounted on the motor, on the shaft. It pivots on the shaft. That allows this to be connected to an anchor point, which I'll show you as I put this thing together further. And then this is connected solid to the motor, and it pushes on that lets it go around, and then comes back and parks itself. So now let me uh, put the rest of it together, and you can see it actually working with the spring tension on it. Okay, for starters, you need a basic uh, primer here in micro switches. This is a micro switch. It's a, a pretty simple little device. It has a reed on it and a little switch inside. Three terminals. There's a common a normally closed and a normally open. Normal means the way you see it right now. Nothing is acting upon the switch. It's in its normal position. It's at rest. When I do act upon it, it changes the way that the continuity is going in the switch, which I'll explain now. Right now, nothing's acting upon the switch. It's in a normal state. So this is the common 
This is normally closed. This is normally open. There is continuity right now. Current can run through, in other words, this common and the normally closed because it's in normal position and it's closed. Between here and here is continuity. Between here and the normally open, there is no continuity. Once the switch is acted upon by something, then these two basically switch function. The common is here, the normally closed now goes open. The normally open now goes closed and has continuity between here and the common. There it is, open. Continuity between these two, the normally closed and the common. Acted upon, continuity between these two, the normally open and the common. Right now it is not in the normal position, so that's the one that has continuity with the common. And now it's in the normal position, the normally closed has continuity with the common. There you go. That's the basics on micro switches. Now, on to the circuit. It's really simple. There's a battery here. This is a, out of a Roomba robot in this case. It's a 14.8 volt battery. There's an on-off switch. This particular drawing is in the parked position, turned off. So the switch is open. There's no current flowing through anything. The launch switch is waiting for the ball to hit it. So the switch is not being acted upon. It's in the normally closed position. There's continuity between the common and the normally closed. Let me go ahead and put those two labels on there. Common. Just to keep track of what you're seeing, it'll help you out. The park switch does have something acting on it. What is acting on it? It's that little cam I showed you on the rotating drum of the window motor because it's parked. So the cam is pushing on the switch, causing the normally open and the common to have continuity because it's not in a normal position anymore. It is being acted upon. It has been triggered. So the way this is wired, there is no current running to the motor at this point. Now I'm going to draw this again and show you what happens when the ball hits the switch. Okay, things have changed. We've turned on the device. The ball has hit the launch switch. It's changed it from its state of normally closed to being acted upon, so now it's at the normally open position, connected, right? So we have common and normally open with continuity. Since that happened, now power can flow through here, through here, through this switch to the motor. The motor begins to spin. Now as the motor begins to spin, the ball is still sitting here, right? Our ball is here pushing on the switch until it gets launched. But the motor has begun to spin. So now it is rolled off from the cam that's acting upon the park switch. Once that happens, the park switch moves to the other position, normally closed. Nothing is acting upon it, so it goes normally closed. So now it has continuity between the common and the normally closed. The, ball, the motor continues to rotate, the ball gets launched. Once the ball gets launched, what happens? The switch is no longer being acted upon. It goes back to its normally closed position. But, since we came off from the cam, and we're not acting upon this switch anymore, and it's in its normally closed state, the power runs through here now, and continues to run the motor until it goes all the way around the ball is out of the equation now because it's been launched. The thing is spun around, the spring is triggered, and it's gone. But the motor continues to run until it comes all the way back up around to the rest position where what happens? The cam acts upon the park switch once again. Once that happens, this goes back to a position where it's on the normally open. It is no longer having continuity to this, therefore power is not running to the motor. This has now gone back to a state of no power and everything stops. It's all parked again. There you go. That's the basics of it. In a sense this is a logic gate. Um, I'm not sure what kind of a logic gate you would call that. Uh, but anyway, it's, it's kind of a logic gate. 
So that's the basics of the electronics. It's really quite simple and you'll find that this particular setup of limit switches is a very common thing in a lot of devices where a cycle has to happen. Something There's a trigger event, something takes place, the trigger event causes it to happen, the event is over with, another switch stops it. That's the basics of how to achieve that. Everything has been reassembled and I'll uh, go ahead and trigger this and let you watch it in action now after you've seen how it works and how all these switches do their thing. Down in there is the, uh, the trigger switch, way down in there. And then again, there's the one that does the parking. And let me turn the device on and go ahead and trigger it with my hand and get it the heck out of the way because it really hurts when it hits you. Oops. Had to get away. Happens pretty fast, huh? Let's watch that one more time. It <laughs> jarred the battery loose. So there it is. The switch gets triggered. It launches the ball, comes back around. The park switch comes into play, turns off the motor, and that is that. Now, a few problems that arose during this. There's a lot of spring tension pulling on this this thing, and a thing I noticed I was having problems with was right in here. This was really getting torqued sideways, like you know, um, that way, really bad. So I had to do a little uh, reworking of the way that I had reinforced all this background here on everything. That's why you see this aluminum plate. It uh, kept the motor from, from torquing like this. So there's some things to keep in mind when you do this kind of stuff. You need to mount that motor very securely. You need to have a power window motor with a shaft that's really solid in there. It can't deviate like this or you'll be in trouble. You'll run into a lot of trouble because that spring tension when it loads up on the back side of this cam is pretty darn intense. So you need to pay attention to that when you're choosing a motor. I don't really know what this one came out of. I can't remember. It was just laying around the shop. Someone else pulled it out and I salvaged it. But uh, keep that in mind when you put things together. See, there's a lot of spring tension on it. So, there you go. That's how it all works. And it's been my pleasure to show this to you. And uh, there I am. Okay. And uh, I'm looking forward to seeing what you guys build. I'd like to see some videos. You can email me uh, with any questions you might have. I'd be glad to help out. It's makerdino at gmail.com. You can take a look at my websites, dinofab.com and hackaweek.com. The Hackaweek site is a lot of fun. I'm coming up with a project every week for the next year, which is pretty mind-boggling. Um, I've got about maybe 15 of them on the list, but I just have to keep going and see how that goes. It's a lot of fun. It's a good challenge, and it's uh, you know a self-imposed thing, and it's working out pretty good. So, like I said, keep me posted on what goes on. Email me if you have any questions, and uh, look forward to seeing what uh, comes up. Good luck in your final project. Hope you guys all have a great summer, and good luck in your careers as engineers. All right, bye-bye.